Prince William met Kate at St Andrews University and they were both history of art students. They were both in the same halls of residence. It's said that there was kind of a huge rush for people to send their daughters there, but I imagine, in fact, that the daughters already had their places. There have been some comments and some kind of jibes against the Middleton family that Carol Middleton had planned the fact that her daughter Kate was going to go to St Andrews University and was going to marry a prince. I don't really think it was planned, but you never know. It is said that William first um, sort of clocked her when he went to a, I think it was a fashion show. Kate was actually modelling in a now famous virtually see-through, um, you know, chiffon piece of a dress, and he actually saw her walking down the catwalk. The photograph of it was filed to all the newspapers in London, and I looked at it and thought, oh, no, no, she's a brunette. William doesn't like brunettes, he likes blondes. How wrong was I? and William was right in the front row, and um, there was Kate, and he thought, whoa, she's hot. Hidden from the press at St Andrews, their relationship blossomed, but after graduation, under the glare of the world's media, and with William cautious as a result of his parents' failed relationship, he got cold feet. Well, with all passionate young relationships, there's got to be a blip. And William and Kate's blip came in 2007. And William instigated the breakup. I think he thought, I'm getting too tied down. Do I really want to be with this girl? She was very upset. William had a big chat with Dad Charles, and he said, you need to know that you're going to get married to her, otherwise it's really not fair on her. And I think he obviously had cold feet, as most guys do. Kate was seen all over London clubbing, out looking extremely happy as if she didn't have a care in the world. If you ever want to win a man back, make yourself look fantastic and let him know that you're out and having a great time. They realised that they were really good friends and they missed each other and I think within a couple of weeks they were texting each other. And this being a royal relationship, Kate was reintroduced to the world very publicly as William completed his military training. Kate, with her parents, attended the Passing Out Parade. And that was, in a way, looking back, a kind of way that the, uh, the way that she would be officially brought forward. On the 16th of November, 2010, William and Kate finally announced their engagement. My first reaction when I heard about the engagement is that it was just wonderful. I think wonderful for them, and certainly I think wonderful for, for the country. I was like, yes, she'd done it at last. She'd been called Weighty Katie for such a long time. It, it's the sort of occasion that Britain responds really well to, and it's just great to have some good news. I found out about the engagement from my mobile phone. I suddenly had a frenzy of tweets. I thought, fantastic, thank goodness, at last. The worldwide press went crazy. I was standing outside Buckingham Palace with the rest of the world. Do you know, you're going to think I'm really awful. I, I can't remember where I was, actually, because I heard it on the news, but my reaction was very definite. I thought, about time too. And they're a lovely couple. It's great. And to me, this is our future. It's all about the future. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Sometimes the royal family, we don't hear much about them, and sometimes we hear it because there's controversy. So to hear a story of joy and delight and new beginnings was heartening. Well, everybody said they were delighted. Queen was delighted. But, uh, you know, that's what everybody says when a couple get engaged. Of course they were. I, I mean, I didn't speak personally to the Queen and say, are you really delighted or are you just being polite? I first met her at um, Peter and... Autumn's wedding. She was very friendly, and no, it was, it was, yeah, it was fine. She's very welcoming. She knew yeah. it was, um, it was, uh, you know, it was a big day, and everything was going on. Peter and Autumn were there, and things, and she's, uh, she'd wanted to meet Kate and uh, for a while, so it was very nice of her to come over and say hello, and we had a little chat, and it got on really well. I know that she approves of her because she's very, very keen on this family thing, you know, because she looks at Diana and Fergie and, and, and how their parents' divorce, you know, affected them. And I think she's absolutely delighted that Kate comes from a very close-knit family. And the Queen is the least snobbish person of all her subjects. She doesn't care at all that Kate comes from a working-class background. I thought Prince Harry's reaction was the most charming when he said she was the sister that he'd never had, which was great. Um, the Prince of Wales was rather disappointing, I thought, when he said they'd been practising long enough. I mean, one would wonder whether he hadn't been practising long enough talking to the media. What I would have liked him to have said was, I just can't wait to welcome this lovely girl into the family. Diana said to William, when, when he was quite a young 
you know, young teenager. He said, so whatever you do, darling, marry someone who's your friend. And though, you know, William is a very sensitive and spiritual soul, and he remembers what his mother said to him, and I think that had a lot to do with it. William's desire to keep his mother's memory alive and to make her part of proceedings was obvious in his choice of engagement ring. I've been reliably informed it's a sapphire with some diamonds, but I'm sure everyone recognises it from, uh, from previous times, so... And Kate, yeah, you're, probably, you're going to be an envy of many, I would Well, imagine. I just hope I look after it. Yeah. She loses it it's, in big very, trouble. it's very, very special. I think it's a touching, wonderful thing to do. It's a symbol of how much he adores her and worships her. And I know one or two people have said, gosh, you know, is it not tainted by his parents' marriage or the way Princess Diana died? But I don't feel that at all. I sort of stood back a little bit with that, thinking, oh my gosh, that's a little bit sort of, is that right? But then I thought he loved her so much, or still loves her, you know, it's in him. He wants the feeling that the mother is there, that Diane is there. This was his way of dealing with it. And now I think it's rather special. After she got divorced, Diana said, I don't need this ring anymore, William. I want you to have it and give it to your future wife. She said, if she wants it, she said. Diana hadn't been forgotten and she will be present at, in, in a way at her son's wedding, yes. I just think that's lovely that treasures carry on and treasures are loved and treasures are worn and that treasures don't sit idly in boxes. I think that's very good. As wedding fever grips the world, talk turns to who will be lucky enough to receive an invitation to the biggest event of the century. I have been invited to the Royal Wedding and I'm very honoured to have been invited and I'm in a little bit of a quandary about what I'm wearing because I think it's very unfair to wear a big hat. I did think this morning perhaps I ought to invest in a new hat that was fairer to the person who was sitting behind me. There'll always be a couple of celebrities. I think Elton John is going, um, people like that. I was very surprised when the Duchess of York um, wasn't invited. I think the wedding would have been a more fun party had she been included. <laughs> Along with the nightmare of who to invite and not to invite, Kate Middleton must ensure that she is fully prepared for the role of royal princess. I always think of Kate Middleton as being very poised. She's self-assured, she's confident without being overly so. She seems like she's just really a complete natural in the role. She almost seems like a princess already. She's really overshadowing William though. He's in the background of all these photos. He's, he's kind of slightly balding hair, just wisping about in the wind while she's there looking glamorous with her fascinator and amazing makeup. I really sense a maturity in Kate that of course Diana didn't have. Diana was much younger, I mean 10 years younger at the time. And that 10 years is significant. Diana was little more than a child. She had no experience whatsoever. She was teaching at a kindergarten. Nobody was guiding her. But I think they'll make absolutely sure that Kate is embraced within the royal family. Well, Kate is very lucky because she had a very good mum who taught her beautiful manners. That's what Camilla said. She has the most beautiful manners, that girl. So she doesn't need any manner training. And just in royal etiquette, she's got our former ambassador to Washington, Sir David Manning, who is helping her in sort of protocol and foreign affairs. But of course, she's got the best advisor in the world, and that's Prince William. I don't know the ropes really, William was obviously used to it, but, um, but no, I'm, I'm willing to learn quickly and, and work hard. And I'm, She'll do really well. Yeah. We'll do that well. When somebody says they're very willing to learn, a lot of people are very willing to help. I'm Liz Brewer and I'm UK's etiquette expert and we're in my home in the middle of Belgravia, London, and we're here really to advise Kate into how she's going to become Princess Catherine. So when Kate's out and about and doing one of her duties, she is going to be given bunches of flowers and needs to know what to do with them. So you have to learn how to be able to do this gracefully, to be able to take one or two bunches of flowers and then once it gets too many, discreetly be able to just pass it to her lady-in-waiting who will be probably on the right-hand side or behind her. The Queen. She would always curtsy to the Queen. So you have to put the leg behind, a little bob, head down and up. 
So sitting is very important. And for example, getting in and out of a car. OK, I'm opening the door of the car. You then turn your bottom around. You sit down, butt goes in first, and then you swing your legs in, keeping the knees together. There'll be so many cameras around, etc. you've got to be careful. It's exactly the same getting out of the car. Usually, there will be somebody there with a hand to help you. From now on, I think there'll always be a hand to help her. This training was put into action at Kate's first official engagement as William's fiancée, when the couple returned to their old university stomping ground for a public appearance. So it is all about Kate now, um, for good and for bad, because that's why people are then noticing that she's losing a little bit too much weight and comparing her with Princess Diana. I mean, when we first clapped eyes on her back in about 2002, she had curly hair, she had more pounds on her frame, and suddenly she got thinner and thinner and thinner. She's probably a size zero. And I kept saying to my office, that girl is so slim, you ought to see her. She looked very anorexic to me. Kate's weight loss will always draw comparisons with um, uh, Diana and her bulimia. None of us want to see her looking pale and drawn and, and sort of skeletal walking down the aisle. Any bride uh, about to get married is going to, to have a huge amount of pressure. It's the biggest day of your life. Uh, and even if you're having a very low-key wedding, this is still going to sort of be overwhelming in terms of pressure. I don't think she's skinny to the point where she looks unhealthy or sick. I think she just wants to look really, really good for her wedding day. So, with the engagement announced, the wedding preparations begin. One of the biggest decisions a bride has to make on her wedding day is what to do with her hair. And Kate Middleton has more pressure than most. How should Kate wear her hair on the day? Well, look, speaking as a, as a lady who has always had her hair up, I like hair that is taken away from the face. A lot of brides with long hair wear it up on their wedding day because you stick it up with five million pins in it and lots of lacquer, and it stays like that all day and half the night. But we know Kate as a girl with long hair, wonderful, moving, shiny, glossy hair. And I think to see her with her hair up, would she'd look like a stranger. She has beautiful hair, and I'm sure William loves to see Kate's hair, you know, these great chestnut tresses down over her shoulders. Probably William loves all that hair spread out on a pillow, so I don't think we've got any say at all. Royal brides have the eyes of the world on them on their big day, and historically, they've sometimes got it wrong. If I was Kate, I would make sure that the person that did my hair knew how to fix hair with a tiara, because Diana's hairdresser, Kevin Shanley, didn't, and her tiara squashed her fringe right down over her face. She wasn't happy about that. If you remember, the Duchess of York went in with flowers on her head, and magically came out with a tiara on. In fact, it was flowers put in front of the tiara which were taken off in the vestry. It is a sort of pagan rite that a royal bride on her wedding day will wear a tiara. The Queen's wedding tiara was a sort of starburst, um, rather Russian in style, and I suppose it could be something like that. It's not frilly frilly, and I suspect that Kate Middleton likes style and chic, that, you know, that she's stepping into royalty somehow, which is very important. It's her, it's her badge of office. She's got the hat. <laughs> At his Mayfair salon, Britain's most celebrated hairdresser, Nicky Clark, knows all about royal hairstyling. I've been blessed to have done an awful lot of the royal family, certainly with uh, the Duchess of York, Princess Diana, um, and a number of other royals as well. I think Kate has really wonderful hair, and I think what makes it so special is the fact that it isn't really complicated. It's not a particularly difficult haircut. But will Kate be tempted to take inspiration from Hollywood's most glamorous screen actresses? Eva Longoria's hair is a very sort of formal, very Hollywood-esque. I don't think that that would be right. That would only work if she was wearing something incredibly high necked that almost had a kind of Edwardian feel. I really like Mini Driver's hairstyle. I think it's it's quite fun, it's still elegant, and she's still got a little bit of length there. 
but I still think Kate should have all of it down. I don't personally feel that this is a hairstyle that would suit Kate. Unless she is in almost period costume, it does look as if it's from the 19th century. Could opt for something like Kate Beckinsale, um, a kind of more tousled updo, which I think would suit her face a bit better because you're used to seeing her with her hair down most of the time. Some of the elements I think will work on Kate's hair, although having it much, much longer at the back would be better. But Kate has to strike the difficult balance between being a slave to current celebrity fashion and maintaining a more traditional, regal style. If we were doing the hair on the day, I would certainly be recommending to my stylist that kind of feeling of keeping what she is all about. Knowing that it's probably going to have a tiara on it, you really need to be able to have something that is still kept away, that still adds a little bit of formality. It's likely that there's probably going to be a, a train of chul behind. So although it's actually important that it has some kind of movement, you're probably not gonna see that from the back. What you see from the front is really where she has a number of options. We've done the option of keeping it quite formal in the front, but most of that cascading curls and waves are there in order to frame her silhouette. Now you can do that if you have thick enough hair, Kate certainly does have, or you can add in hair pieces and just make that sometimes just a little bit bulkier because it can withstand the, the rigors of the day. The dress. Uh, everybody's speculating about the dress. Walking down the, the miles of aisle at the Abbey, <laughs> she's got to please an awful lot of people. First of all, she's got to please herself. The next person she undoubtedly wants to please is her groom. Then it's her family, then his family. Then, for a royal bride, she's also got the eyes of the world. The planning of her not just her wedding, but her dress will be important. I think Kate will stay simple. I think it will be glamorous, but I think it will have huge amount of elegance and style. We're all dying to know what Kate's dress is going to look like. I imagine she'll be ivory white cream, something classical. I think it's going to be quite a simple design to silhouette her beautiful figure. Obviously, the last big royal wedding was the wedding between Prince Charles and the then Lady Diana, so you're going to compare the dresses that Diana had to Kate. She'll probably want to have a point of difference to Diana in every way, even down to the detail. Diana's was a complete meringue. I mean, it was the Emmanuel's design that dress. Obviously, it was of that time because it was in the 80s. Now, when you look back at it, it's like when you look back on your awful outfits from the 80s and you just say, oh, that's hideous. And worthy of the great church of St Paul. Diane Spencer had a kind of rather overpowering dress, which actually, as she stepped out of the carriage, looked rather like a duvet, so it looked rather creased. Because she's going to be moving quite a long way from the Great West Door right up to the high altar, I would be very surprised if there wasn't a long train, and I think in her case it would need to be a very sort of light material. Diana's was something like, I think, 25 feet or something. It was huge. That's an awful lot to manage. Whether Kate takes inspiration from history or decides to opt for a more contemporary look is largely in the hands of the person who is commissioned to design her dress. Who's going to make Kate Middleton's dress? It's the million dollar question. I don't know who'll design Kate's dress, but I rather feel it will be the creme de la creme of designers, because that's what the Middletons are like. They want the very best for their children. And I can't believe that she would choose someone unknown. I don't think Bruce Oldfield's going to do it because he's associated too much with Diana. Unfortunately, she doesn't have a totally free choice. She must support British fashion, and otherwise there'd be a huge outcry from the uh, British fashion world. The person that seems to be um, holding that golden ticket is Sarah Burton, who is the head designer for Alexander McQueen. The McQueen house has denied it, but you're gonna deny it, aren't you? There are lots of people, too numerous to mention. On the wedding of the century, we've seen the royal bride's look take shape. And the world is waiting with bated breath for the first glimpse of Kate Middleton's wedding dress. 
Will Kate take inspiration from the past, or will she be under pressure to dazzle with a groundbreaking new look? Jacques Azaguri, a great friend of Princess Diana's and one of her favorite designers, has clear ideas about the royal wedding gown. As a designer, really, I think the important thing is to remember that it's, even though we want it to be a very modern day wedding, we have to keep it traditional and we have to stick to protocol. His vision for the dress takes the best of tradition, adding a dramatic flourish. This is a body, the finest, finest gauzy lace that would show her skin coming through, dotted with tiny micro diamantes all over just to get a bit of sparkle, and embroideries on the cuffs there. The dress underneath could end up as a completely strapless dress, or she could keep the body on. The most important part of the dress is the overskirt, which is going to have the whole drama. It's beaded at the hemline and beaded all the way down the center of the back. The veil would echo the shape of the dress. The dress would be covered from head to toe in a very fine Chantilly lace with beading embroidery on it. For a royal wedding dress, I would say probably from start to finish, there would be between 30 and 50 people involved in making that dress. Yeah, if you take all the bits into consideration. Sassy Holford is best known for designing Autumn Kelly's wedding dress when she married Peter Phillips, the son of Princess Anne and grandson of the Queen. She knows all about designing on a grand scale. With somewhere as big as Westminster Abbey, the dress has to have some kind of volume to it, otherwise she will become such a small part of such an enormous occasion. I wanted to encapsulate her youth and her beauty, but also make it really appropriate for the occasion. So I've gone for a fit and flare, shows off her fabulous figure, shows off a lovely waist, hips, but it allows you to flare the skirt out so you can get a full, full skirt. It's got to have covered arms for protocol, but you won't want it to look mumsy, so I've chosen a quite a 40s neckline, and I've been a little bit daring. I've taken the back down lower, just to show that she is a young, fashionable young woman. I think the fabrics I would choose would be a beautiful beaded lace. We could do matching beadwork onto the lace around the hem on the full skirt, which would be so beautiful. I think Kate Middleton, if any bride can bring this dress into the 21st century for the royal family, she's the one that can pull it off. At her Knightsbridge studio, celebrity bridal designer Suzanne Neville puts the finishing touches to her interpretation of what Kate's dress will look like. With the dress, it has got to travel well. She's going to be sitting in a car for some time. The last thing people are going to want to see is lots of creased fabric and thinking, well, what's the design about? So the dress has got to look as dreamy after the car journey. Otherwise, that's all we're going to hear for years to come. I've chosen this veil because it's, it's simple yet traditional. It has got a few little sparkles and diamantes on there, so it just catches the light. So when all the flashes are going, it will really sort of pick up the light. I've chosen this lovely lace top over the dress because it's, it has a really nice layering effect. And instead of it just being like a harsh bodice, you do get this little soft line here. It still covers the arm up, but you've got a nice wide neckline, so it shows all Kate's neck bones beautifully. It allows space for a necklace and gives a nice long line without too much flesh on show. But I'm really loving this whole beaded belt um, to actually tie in with the tiara. It adds that little bit of glitz to it. So it's still, you know, it's in this century, it's modern, it's new. I love this fabric on the skirt so much because it's, it's got a transparency to it, it's got movement, and I would use an organza that doesn't crease too much, layered beautifully, and just moulded to her. It's almost like it's been sprayed on, just to show her figure off and really be the best, the best dress that anybody could ever do. No bridal look is complete without a bouquet, but will the English rose pick tradition or follow a blossoming new trend? Bouquets are enormously important. They're a lifeline apart from anything else. You've got something to clutch. In the past, all the royal brides have had large bouquets. And they sort of held them, they've trailed almost to the ground with sort of big roses and a lot of foliage around them. The traditional thing you would find 
in a royal bouquet would be a sprig of myrtle from um, the, the, the myrtle bush in the gardens of Osborne, which were a part of the uh, wedding bouquet of Queen Victoria. And myrtle represents uh, love and purity. If you remember Diana's, it was wonderful and sort of ivy and beautiful white flowers. And Autumn Kelly followed very into a very similar effect um, with her wedding bouquet. I would like to think that Kate will be a little bit more contemporary with the flowers and maybe hold something quite small and simple, maybe um, heads of roses in her hands. That would be amazing. Um, just because those ones are very big and almost quite old fashioned now. Simon Lysett is no stranger to creating a posh bridal posy. I was lucky enough to be asked to do the flowers for the Beckham's wedding for David and Victoria when they got married in Ireland. And then, of course, I was asked to do the flowers at the reception of the wedding of the Prince of Wales to the Duchess of Cornwall. Were I to be creating Kate's wedding bouquet, I think I would use a variety of traditional flowers, lovely, fresh, spring-like um, foliages and flowers, and I'd probably make sure that I included some wonderful myrtle. Apart from myrtle, we have beautiful things like lilac, which during sort of late April, early May, is starting to come into our gardens and it smells beautiful. It has these lovely, delicate, soft flowers. Of course, beautiful roses, be they the large cabbagey roses or the, the smaller little spray roses, which also look very beautiful, as well as lovely jasmine, these sort of trails of jasmine, which we break down into slightly smaller components. And these have a lovely delicacy, a bit of movement and some soft fragrance. And one of the things that smells most beautiful at this time of the year is the paper white narcissi. Lovely and spring-like. And talking of beautiful fragrances, what could be more yummy than the freesia? Which a lot of people underestimate, but again, that peppery, gingery smell. And these are a lovely double white variety, so they'll give a nice textural interest to the bouquet. And it's important to have flowers of different shapes and also some foliages. So things like the gardenia foliage with these gorgeous, glossy, glossy leaves. And of course, rosemary, which Shakespeare said symbolised remembrance. And smells beautiful and it could be poignant to have a little bit of that in the bouquet as well. There is a ratio between the size of bouquet and size of wedding dress, and I always think that if a bride's wearing quite a fulsome dress, then she needs a, a nice big bouquet. In terms of the stag and hen, Prince Harry is the organiser of the stag. If Harry's got anything to do with it, it'll be a riot. <laughs> and you can imagine he really wants to just go to town and really just wind his brother William up, and I'm sure he had loads of tricks up his sleeve. Who knows what he might do? He could bring strippers, although I don't think that's really Will's style. William is just not going to have a look in or a say in any way, shape or form. Um, his little brother will be delighted to lead him astray. But William, when he said, you're going to be my best man, he said the condition of that was no wild stag do. Don't have it in London, because the paparazzi will find you and pap you to death. I think if I was having a hen party, God, I never had a hen party, um, I would probably want to have it in somebody's house because I would be really worried about being seen drunk and disorderly. I mean, her sister, Pippa, in any case, is doing a, a hen party for her. It's going to be very discreet and in the country, in a house, well out of prying eyes. Naturally, Kate's hen would have been more refined anyway. Some might say a little boring. I mean, it sounds like it's going to be... There was a report that she was going to be watching Dirty Dancing with a group of her friends just in a country house. I mean, come on. The royal wedding of Kate Middleton and Prince William will have the pomp and ceremony that the British do best. The royal route to Westminster Abbey passes some of London's most famous landmarks, and the day's events will follow a strict protocol. Well, on the day of the wedding, the members of the royal family will leave Buckingham Palace. The first to leave will be the lowest on the pecking order. Prince Edward and his family, Princess Anne and her children, Zara, Phillips, etc. And then there'll be the Yorks, Prince Andrew and his daughters, Princess Beatrice, Princess Eugenie. And then the Queen will be last to leave Buckingham Palace. She'll be the last to arrive at the Abbey before the bride. The princes will be leaving from their home, just down the Mall. Behind me is, is Clarence House, the home to the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. Now, it's from this house that Prince William 
and his best man, Prince Harry, uh, will leave on that morning just ahead of his bride-to-be, Catherine. For the princes, this will have poignant memories for them. The last time that the mall was used ceremonially in, in royal terms was, of course, um, the day of the late Diana, the Prince of Wales's funeral. And on this day, this most joyous day of his wedding, I'm sure he'd be giving a great deal of thought to that day 11 years ago. As William and Harry wait at Westminster Abbey, Kate Middleton will be leaving Buckingham Palace with her father. That will be an enormous comfort and strength to her. As for every girl getting married, it's lovely to have your dad there with you. With any luck, she'll be able to take a deep breath and have a look around her and smile and enjoy the moment. The royal route will follow past the Houses of Parliament until they reach their final destination, Westminster Abbey. Well, behind me now, of course, is the, the great west door of Westminster Abbey, and it's to this door that, that Kate Middleton and her father will arrive from Buckingham Palace. Ahead of her, of course, Prince William will be waiting inside. But behind Kate Middleton, this huge gallery of press, the world's media, waiting for what? That one picture. What is the dress like? There is going to be that moment when the car door will open and her father will step out and then she will step out. The frock. It'll have to be a big car because hopefully it'll be a lot of dress. This is the moment everyone has been waiting for. Everyone's been building up to it for so long. So you cannot even begin to imagine just how much her heart is going to be beating when she gets out of that car. Kate Middleton will enter the Abbey a commoner and exit with Prince William, a princess. I expect they'll just be mighty relieved that they've done the official bit. I would imagine they're going to come out with the biggest smiles on their faces and it will be at that point where they can really stand there and go, wow, this is all completely amazing. And into their carriage, they begin this journey from Westminster Abbey back to Buckingham Palace for the celebrations to begin. The whole of the mall will be full of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It'll be almost unreal. Probably take ages because they'll just, and their hands will hurt from all the waving they've got to do. And it'll go so slowly for them because there's just going to be millions and millions of people lining the streets, desperate to catch a glimpse of who are now our prince and formerly his princess. It's going to be an incredible moment for the whole country. Well, the worldwide press are going to want one picture, and that's the kiss. But it's not really a tradition that the couple, the royal couple that get married have a kiss on that balcony. It was actually Prince Charles and uh, Diana that had the kiss first of all, because the public were just shouting to them, going, kiss, 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 and I don't think he really wanted to. He was a bit awkward about it. And she said, well, come on, why don't we do it then? So Fergie and Prince Andrew, when they got married, they had a little kiss on the balcony. Yeah, I definitely want to see them have a kiss. Why not? They should. They deserve it. I think there'll be huge pressure from the crowd for them to have a kiss. If Kate and William do not give a, each other a great big smacker on that balcony of Buckingham Palace, you'll hear a sort of collective sigh of, oh! So we want a full-on snog. That's what the public are going to be waiting for. Britain has undergone a culinary revolution, producing exquisite food nationwide, and with it, a new breed of celebrated chefs. I'm so interested to find out who's going to be catering for the royal wedding and whether or not they will use some of our wonderful celebrity chefs. They may bring Rick Stein in from, from Cornwall to do a fish starter. I doubt it very much. They'll be using Heston, I wouldn't imagine. Uh, but they could do. And maybe Hugh Fernie Whittingshaw for the starter. Hugh and Prince Charles share very, very similar food values. And I'd like to see Jamie Oliver. Jamie Oliver's worked so hard for British food, and um, I think he's got a warm affection in everyone's hearts. So the evening celebration, which again is in Buckingham Palace, hosted by Prince Charles. Kate Middleton then, as Princess Catherine, she will be able to go up to her room with Prince William, and she will change, and they'll have a rest. No doubt, they'll consummate the marriage. <laughs> but what food would one serve at a right royal occasion? I think William and Kate will choose a predominantly British menu and will very much use local and seasonal food. So whether that's beef from Sandringham or, or maybe Welsh lamb, a saddle of Welsh lamb could be absolutely wonderful. I think they'll start with Scottish salmon, of course. I will have a cannon of lamb 
Beautiful, beautifully pink. And you know what I would do? Serve it with Jersey rolls, which will be just in season. I mean, how exciting with that, with lots of parsley, lots of butter on the table. How delicious. The pudding, I can't tell you what it will be, but I'm certain it will be absolute fantasy. It's been a tradition over the last century that all royal weddings, uh, the, the menu is, is finished with strawberries and cream. <gasps> How delicious is that? The most terrifying prospect for any best man and father of the bride, with potential for embarrassing revelations, are the dreaded speeches. Our royal insider reveals who will be in the firing line on the big day. Obviously, Prince William will make a speech, and his best man will make a speech, which is Prince Harry. Maybe a representative from the Middleton family. And I think if Prince Charles feels like speaking, he might speak, but I would say that definitely the Queen won't speak. She makes a lot of speeches. I think she ought to be given a time off. Britain's leading master cake maker, Eric Lanlard, responsible for creating the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall's wedding cake, has the cake-making credentials to cook up a storm on the big day. Obviously, a big speculation about what the cake's going to be like or who's going to make the cakes. And, um, well, I'm not going to tell you if I, if I will or not, <laughs> obviously. As far as the wedding cake's concerned, it has to be something fairly dramatic. It has to be something memorable. It has to be something delicious. They are young, they have a great sense of, um, of fun, you know. Maybe you're going to surprise us, or maybe we're going to go for something completely different. And uh, I know William likes his chocolate cakes, because we made a lot of chocolate cake in the past for him, so. They have to remember everybody wants a piece of wedding cake, because traditionally it brings luck. And the top layer is saved for the christening of the first child. So you'd have a little piece of cake to take home with you. That would be such a lovely thing to do. Prince William and Kate Middleton have form when it comes to letting their hair down, but on a royal occasion, the pressure is on. I think the first dance is about the most diabolically unkind thing to make any couple do on their wedding day. Hands up. And the amount of nerves and tension that this causes, rather like making speeches, is unbelievable. And I've been to more dance classes with couples when they wanted to learn the tango or to break dance. And I can tell you, it's very nearly each time has broken up the engagement. There's been so many rows about it. I think it should be abolished. With William being second in line to the throne, it's very important that he would learn how to dance. Ready? And step. Lovely. Now step to the side. We would expect him, as he is a gentleman, to be able to just do a few basic steps. But a little bit wonky there, let's go the other way. For their first dance, I'd like to think that they would do a classic waltz or something really, really beautiful, a lovely classic dance. One, two, you almost got a foot then. I mean, obviously they have a song that they both like. I'd love to think that their first dance will be to I've Had the Time of My Life from Dirty Dancing. Had set, guide her, don't push her. Wouldn't that be amazing? And then Prince William can just dance down the aisle a bit like Patrick Swayze. Twirl in. Nice hand over the top. Don't drop her. And beautiful. As they settle into married life, the world will be waiting to hear the pitter-patter of tiny feet. It's something we're all dying to hear about. You know, after they get married, it'll be, when are the babies coming? Sometimes the most beautiful parents have the most hideous children. Now, who has the stronger genes? That's an interesting one. They're both very good-looking people, so it'll, they'll have good-looking babies, definitely. Kate's got green eyes. William's got blue eyes. So they'll probably have fairly light-eyed children. Well, he's got quite a soft, plump little face, and he always did have as a baby. She's got more finely honed, defined features. But if they have any sons, they'll start worrying early on about patches in their thatch. William and Kate will be under pressure to keep with royal tradition when it comes to naming their offspring. It would be good to go for a royal name, but also a name which, which they feel comfortable with. I think that perhaps they might pick traditional names for their children. You see, she's Catherine Elizabeth, and William is William Arthur Philip Louis. 
I think Prince Charles wanted to call him Arthur, and Diana said, not on my Nelly. Princess Anne surprised us all by calling her daughter Zara. I don't think we'll be looking at Tallulah or <laughs> Apple. I don't think so. They probably call their son Philip, because William is very, very close to his grandfather. If it's a girl, I'd suspect the name Diana will appear somewhere along the line. With a lifetime of royal duties ahead on the world stage, will William and Kate buck the royal trend and maintain a happy marriage? I think it's a marriage made in heaven. This marriage has got to last. There have been too many broken homes, and William's more conscious of that than any of us. You know, a lot of people just felt very removed from the monarchy, and I think they've really brought the whole country together. What Prince William has done and is doing is bringing us into the 21st century, having a far more modern and healthy approach to being the future king. I think Kate will be a terrific future queen. She's beautiful, she's dignified, she's the sort of girl that will get on with the job, and I think she'll be terrific. I do think her first duty is to provide the throne with an heir, and then a spare, of course. So once she's done that, everybody will say, fantastic, great, you've got the job for life. I cannot downplay the importance that Prince William and Kate Middleton now hold for the image of the royal family. What Princess Diana started was that sense that the public could relate um, to the royal family, and I think that was pulled back a bit after her death, and I think William and Kate have the perfect opportunity to present a royal family that we can empathise with, love, celebrate, adore, and I think the world's eyes are absolutely upon them. <laughs>